As we continue with the Unsung Heroes series, tonight we're going to be talking about Epaphroditus. And uh, about half the lesson is going to be from the book. The other half is uh, incidental or historical background that ties to this period, this very uh, time frame that Paul and Epaphroditus are together in Rome. And if you got the email, you'll see the other questions that relate to this that go beyond the uh, scope of the book. It was good to see everybody out. A little light on attendance, but that happens sometimes on Wednesdays. Wednesdays. Let's go ahead and uh, take a moment now and go to God in prayer. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to gather together and study. We thank you for the fact that you've handed down your holy scriptures and your holy word down through the ages that we can study from it regularly. We pray that all the classes would be edified this evening at this congregation and beyond. We thank you for the guidance and the wisdom that comes from your word. Help us apply the things that we learn to our lives and be prepared to share those truths with others. We thank you so much for the promise of heaven that comes through the way of the plan of your, your plan of salvation and the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for our sins. Let us never forget this profound sacrifice that was given in our place as we look to Jesus Christ as our Savior. Guide us and direct us in this study and all other opportunities as our prayer according to your will and in Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. So in order to get started, I'd like to see if somebody's willing to volunteer to read the first passage here from Philippians 2, 25 through 30. Phil? Well, I thought it, was necessary, I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him, not only on him, only, not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy. An old man like him in high regard, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Thank you. I would like to take a look at one more passage before we get into the material. Uh, Philippians 4, verse 18, that one verse. Could I have a reader? Go ahead, Bob. Receive full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts. You sent a, fra a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable, pleasing to God. These passages are where we're going to be getting most of our information for what we're going to be talking about tonight. And certainly I welcome everybody's thoughts on this because that's how we learn as we share our individual opinions. So the first question in regards to the historical background, uh, where is Paul during the writing of this apostle and what are his circumstances? What do we know about this? It doesn't, none of this background, or not much of it, is going to come from our reading, so that would require a little research or knowledge of what's happening at this point in time. Okay. He might have thought that his work was going to be more difficult. He had a lot of success doing, getting things accomplished in prison. Such as? Writing and communicating with the churches and, and uh, being in having an effect on the soldiers and people around him because he got treated uh, well while he was there. Gained their respect and gained a little bit of liberty with them. So, and you didn't say it, but he's in Rome. And he happens to be likely in the same camp as the Praetorian Guard. And as a, a part of your comment would also allude to the fact that he's able to talk to a lot of Roman military people. And he's there long enough, he's got the ear of quite a few people. 
and it's discussed in other places in the scriptures that Paul has an avenue of not only uh, the freedom to communicate with the churches, which Epaphroditus is part of this whole program, but he's also himself talking to and associating with soldiers and guards and, and commanders in such a way that he's, he's got an opportunity to convert some of the Romans uh, to Christianity. Any other thoughts in regards to that? Okay, next question. Who were the two noteworthy disciples that were with Paul at the time of this writing? We clearly know one. Timothy and? Epaphroditus. Okay. So at that time of the writing of this, we know there's these two disciples that are uh, in the company of Paul. So what role then did Epaphroditus have regarding Paul's communication with other brethren, as Kevin mentioned? Go ahead, John. His personal messenger. Okay. And what, what places or what place do we know he was a messenger to for Paul? I'm sorry? Philippi, okay. And now, he may have had other connections, but the one we know about is Philippi. Any other thoughts in regards to that? So, um, in 225, I'm sorry, what role, yeah, we, I, the passage that really does help us with this is uh, Philippians 2.25 out of our context and it does read, I have thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your men minister and your messenger and minister to my need. So we've, we've discussed the, him being a messenger but he also served another purpose and apart from that communication what other benefit did Epaphroditus lend to Paul that we can glean from? Okay, but what, what did he, I, that is true. Uh, what, uh, let's take a look at verse 30. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Now this is where he's talking about the Philippi brethren their service to Paul. Epaphroditus was bringing something to Paul from the Philippi brethren. And that was what was, it wasn't complete what they were given. Uh, but Epaphroditus brought to Paul what he could from the Philippians. There's a bigger context here I'm trying to get to and we're taking our time to get there. Uh, also in Philippians 4.18, which we did read earlier, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So Epaphroditus was a messenger. But what else did he do in regards to these passages? Christ almost died doing it. Okay. His diligence to the mission. Okay. What was his mission when he left Philippi? What was he on his way to see Paul to accomplish? Or to bring? <laughs> John, you know? Okay, church. Exactly. To help support Paul where he was at. That's what was lacking. The Philippian brethren could not supply all of what Paul needed. We don't know a lot of details about that, but the, this verse of uh, chapter 2 and verse 30 helps us understand there's a context here of an incomplete offering, but it was they gave what they could. We also know from 4.18 that it, by the time Epaphroditus got to Paul, Paul received what he needed. So there's a, there's a gap in there where Epaphroditus filled in some blanks, which is as 
speculation. Commentaries offer some uh, suggestions as to what Epaphroditus did in order to complete those offerings. Nonetheless, uh, it was important for Paul to receive what he did from the Philippian brethren. And Epaphroditus was the person that was doing that. Of course, a parallel to this would have been happening through many other churches and many other uh, disciples. It's just that we have this example of Epaphroditus being not only a messenger, but a courier of what Paul needed. Any other thoughts, Ed? So, I mean, if you're filling in blanks, you know, he, he must have took secular work of some kind to provide the rest of what Paul needed. Because that's, you know, if you read that in verse 30, because for your work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. So there wasn't enough of what he needed to give him at that time, right then. So he, he does something to make up the difference somehow. And it, it was physically demanded, almost killed him. And we'll get into the trip uh, before we're done about you know, just the time it takes to get from Rome to Philippi. So that, that's exactly right. We, we have to fill in the blanks that if what uh, Paul received was complete, but when the Philippian brethren gave was un incomplete, uh, Epaphroditus took it upon himself to fill in those blanks, which adds to his workload, may ha have an explanation for his health problems, he might have encountered some persecution. A lot of these things are speculation. But there's some blanks that we don't have a solid answer for, but we can speculate about what happened. Nonetheless, that gives credence to uh, the idea that Epaphroditus was a very hard worker and very committed, which ties in with our lesson about him being a fellow uh, worker in Christ. No doubt about it. He knew, he knew how to work. All right, so what was the cause of the distress that Epaphroditus was feeling? This comes up in verse 26, which reads, For he has been longing for you all, and has been distressed, because you heard that he was ill. This might be a little bit of a convoluted answer, but uh, I, I did a lot of studying on this. Hopefully somebody else did too. So what was it? that was causing Epaphroditus the distress. It caused his friends from being sick and them knowing about it. Okay, so the brethren at Philippi were themselves distressed over the condition of Epaphroditus, but that bothered Epaphroditus so much that he wanted to, you know, he wanted to somehow quell the distress that the Philippian brethren were going through at this time because of his condition. Is that not the definition of being selfless? Just a good example. And here he's a worker. So you've got to appreciate this added little twist to the story that uh, probably lends reason to why Paul sent him back and kept Timothy with him. Because Epaphroditus had an emotional and spiritual connection unique to the Philippian brethren. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? Well, I mean, we think of get your cell phone out and text somebody or call them or tell them, you know, let them know you're all right. But, you know, it's a whole, a whole different dynamic back then. They, no way that anybody would know, get word back from him, you know, that he was all right. Or exactly. Doing better. It, it would take weeks for that. Just for somebody to get that message back to the Philippian brethren. So his distress was over the worry that the Philippians had for him regarding his poor health at that time. Of course, we know Epaphroditus did recover, and that's a blessing for sure. I didn't ask any questions about this, but there's a bit of controversy among those who comment about this, and I'm, I'd like to ask the question, uh, is it is there a reason why Paul did not heal Epaphroditus of his illness? It seems like Epaphroditus had to recover on his own before Paul got involved. Yes, Dwight. The, the gift that was Paul, Paul had the, the gift of healing 
and others did too. Uh, but those gifts was to prove the men who they was, to prove the, uh, those that didn't believe, believed. And then when you were, these are Christians, there was no, God didn't interfere or do that. It was set things up in motion, like their health and everything. But if you're a Christian, you wonder why, but it was only to prove that Christ was who he said he was. These men were teaching that. So there's no, no benefit proving anything. Exactly. This would not have uh, been to the furtherance of the gospel, as far as we know. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah good point <laughs> you don't you don't use those blessings God gives you as as a selfish venture yeah. right right okay we went we got through that how successful was Epaphroditus regarding his mission as far as Paul and God were concerned. Of course, we've, we've sort of touched on this already, but I, I like the way this passage reads. Philippians 4.18, once again, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So we can see that not only was... Uh, if not only was Paul satisfied, who else was satisfied? God. So that, it doesn't get any better than that. Any thoughts, comments? All right, so I want to take a little uh, look at the geography and the whole concept of what it took to get from Rome to Philippi. If they had airplanes back then, it would take about an hour and a half for Epaphroditus to fly from Rome to Philippi. But, of course, planes weren't around then. Uh, in fact, they didn't have cars. They didn't have much of anything like we have today that we enjoy. And there's, the map's not very big, but you can, you can get an idea. You've got to go through a, a very horseshoe-shaped trip around to get to Rome once you get to the northern part of uh, Italy, or you go across the, that part of the Mediterranean. And it, uh, in any case, the means of travel was uh, quite slow. I took this excerpt from a commentary on this matter, and I'd like to read it. Estimates of Rome to Philippi range from 700 to 1,200 miles, depending on the route taken. Travel times varied significantly depending on if one traveled by sea or land and the weather at a given time. Further variables included the pace at which one walked or whether one was able to use animals. All such factors made it difficult to estimate how long a trip between Philippi and Rome might take. The shortest route would have been to take the Via Ignatia, which passed through Philippi, west to Epidem Epidemos and Durachum to the coast of Macedonia, about 350 miles, and make the 80 mile sea voyage across the Adriatic Sea to Brundaism. One could, take, well, uh, one could then take the Via Appia, some 350 miles to Rome. In the best conditions, the trip would be made by foot in about six weeks. In less favorable circumstances, it could take three months. So this is not something that those, those messaging, the, the gifts, the delivering, the couriering, none of that happened very quickly. So it helps us maybe step back and take, and take stock of 
you know, how good we have it today when we can tell the treasurer to cut a check for the uh, preacher in Africa and the, it, it gets sent by electronic mail and within a few days the person has his money. Uh, we're, we're well blessed in regards to the technology and the advancements that we enjoy in this era. Uh, hopefully we're doing enough with all that we've been blessed with in regards to you know, keeping the Lord's work going. Any thoughts, comments? Okay, question one. This is getting back to more of the information that is contained in the book. What does the Greek word S-Y-N do to any word it is attached to? The idea of togetherness and cooperation. Okay. And as, uh, it induces the idea of togetherness and cooperation of doing something with someone else. So that it, it's, it's not... It's a very active uh, point of concern when it comes to the verbiage here. Question two, A. What phrase from the reading, that is from the uh, chapter two, 25 to 30, uh, illustrates the SYN concept in the Greek? that doesn't use the S-Y-N word, but the concept is buried in there in the words. And we've already talked about some of that. Brother, my brother, my fellow worker, and my fellow soldier. Okay. Fellow, fellow, bro, uh, fellow worker and fellow soldier. And uh, there's other, other versions read it differently. But that is that very concept in mind that uh, we're trying to focus on. Question 2b, how did Epaphroditus support Paul as a fellow worker? And you'll see here I'm making a distinction here between fellow worker and soldier, if there is a difference. Any comments? We've discussed most of what I think we know Epaphroditus has done and speculated. To his needs, whatever need he had. It could have been anything. Right. Uh, serving as a messenger and as a courier. What about this soldier thought? Is that, uh, is that any different? Because we sing the song, Soldiers of Christ Arise. I would say that soldier is, is for Christ, and serving Paul is for his needs or whatever needs they might have. But if you're advancing the kingdom, and serving that as, as, as a soldier, soldier of Christ. I like that. that yeah. So the, you could look at that as, as disciples, we are more soldiers for Christ in that aspect, and we are fellow workers for each other. I'm not saying that's the way you have to look at it, but it certainly gives us a different view. Did you look at that also as, I think it can also go to the commitment that Aphrodite has had. And if you're looking at a soldier, you're not just a soldier, you're committed to whatever it is that you be are a soldier for. So sometimes just sending food, which is a good thing, there's a difference in that commitment that is, is driving because of your common, uh, your common uh, togetherness in that. And some of the scriptures refer to our work as a Christian in involving battle gear, the sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of faith. Those things also tie into that whole battle or soldier aspect that we, uh, we do battle for Christ by, by his means, not by worldly means, not with worldly weapons, but we use his spiritual weapons of warfare to accomplish our task. Any other thoughts? Okay, so uh, from the book, I, I did like this, this, I'm going to quote from, it said, two men so devoted to Jesus, talking about Epaphroditus and Paul, they were linked together in a common bond and working toward a common end. Their efforts were intertwined and codependent. That really, that, that, that sounds like a rope. 
where all the strands are just twisted together. And I, I just, I can't, I can't say that, you know, any better than these, these words that are chosen. Very creative way of explaining that. Any other thoughts? Go ahead, John. When you're talking about uh, that intertwined and, and to being together, to me, that's a good picture of what the church is supposed to be like. We are interconnected, and we are stronger when we're all connected rather than being out on your own somewhere. Which is core to the one another that we've been touching on. We've been hopscotching across uh, all these other lessons after we actually did that study. And it, it's an undeniable fact that that's what one of our goals should be as we work together as Christians. Also, from Philemon, verse 23 and 24, it mentioned, and this is just a, a passing reference, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, uh, Jesus, Mark, Aristar Aristarchus, and Luke, my fellow workers, and I could go on. Uh, the, book, the writer of the book did a good job of, of laying out that. Uh, hopefully, uh, we didn't miss any of the opportunity to look at all the different ways the scriptures talk about this this uh, fellow concept. Um, how did Epaphroditus help the Philippian church? We know he helped Paul, but it, we also conjecture that he did help the church. How was that help? Or what was it? The support that they wanted to give him. Okay, so they, they perceived an obligation to Paul as many of the other churches did for the apostles in certain occasions when they were working in a destitute area. And they, they needed. And so a church would be compelled to make contribution. This is, was, was by the approval of you know, the apostles and, of course, uh, God. It's a system that was allowed and encouraged. And so they satisfied that agreement through Epaphroditus in this particular case, which did, of course, you can understand Epaphroditus being a hard worker, he had a lot of weight on his shoulders because Paul was dependent on him. So whatever he was able to bring to Paul that Paul was depending on, he was, he was at this, I mean, he might have picked up other people along the way, we don't know about it, but we do know that he saddled a big responsibility. Yes, a comment? It says here in my book that he delivered the original manuscript to the, the, the Philippians, to its original church. So he delivered the, the one of Paul's apostles, one of Paul's books, the original manuscript to the church in Philippians. I don't know if that's true or not. Well, yeah, it, it I, yeah. So that's, and then, you know, from there we've get, we have it. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's traveled a good bit. That's a good point, I appreciate that. So from the last page of our lesson material, it also says here, such a man who had risked his life, whether by taxing his poor health or by an unmentioned example of persecution, was surely a help to any congregation. And that's my comment for his devotion alone. That is just, again, speaks volumes. That's why we, that's one of the wonderful things of studying about people like this and all these unsung heroes that have a glimmer of uh, exceptionalism in them, even, even maybe very brief in the scriptures. And of course, we know everybody's, everything is not recorded either. Question four, what are some things Christians can do to help with church-related obligations? So just taking this, moving it to today, looking at some of these things, knowing that we're not personally couriering to other congregations, uh, in the overarching principles that satisfy the need of the church and the need of you know, the mission of being a soldier for Christ, what are some things that we can fill in this blank with? What are our obligations? It's a very broad question. The need, and you can fill it. Fill it. Okay. I mean, I, I just threw some up here. Uh, Regularly attend services, perform worship duties, that is, teaching, uh, filling, uh, filling one of the duty 
uh, one of the many duties that are needed to fulfill worship and Bible study. Uh, teach class, I uh, said that. Join in a work day, contribute, uh, contribute as you have prospered on the first day of the week, that is Sunday. Uh, you know, that, th that alone is a, a work that individuals can do to further the work of Christ. Uh, help an infirm member, or socialize to enjoy your fellowship. Now we have a fellowship one with another. When we socialize, we're actually exercising you know, or satisfying that to some extent as we get to know each other better and uh, you know, gather socially uh, away from this building. Uh, engage in Bible study at and away from the building. We, we do, do, maybe we don't do enough of that, but we do it. Provide transportation for those in need. Greet visitors, and the list is much longer than this. So these are just suggested, uh, suggested activities that uh, we can consider. Anybody uh, have any other thoughts about this? Preacher's wife in a very area where churches are small. If we know of such areas, uh, encouragement is always helpful to find out what what can be needed, what can be sent. We always struggle uh, not only with money for living, but just getting classroom materials and things like that. If we know of someone in, in small areas, uh, we can write a letter. There's a, there's a letter on uh, Sunday about someone up in Michigan. Well, I can tell you where he is in Michigan. If he's got COVID, he's desperate because the group up there is very, very small. So near the UP, there isn't Christians up in the UP of Michigan. And so we can uh, encourage someone like that by cards or, or whatever. It would make a, it makes a great deal that someone knows that you exist and that you are working for God. I appreciate you bringing that up because one of the sidebars to this whole thought and what we're talking about with with the Philippi brethren and uh, Paul being in Rome is, I, I started to wonder, and I, I've seen some criticism about the fact that maybe we don't associate with our fellow congregations as much as we should. I mean, just on the west side of town is West Broad Street Church of Christ. And how often does this church involve itself with congregations that are less than 20 miles away? Uh, don't we see a lot of that implied in the scriptures where, and I'm not, I'm not saying we're, you know, we need to fix this right now, but I think an open mind to these things is possibly uh, beneficial to us in the kingdom because I, I was told by uh, Andrew Thornburg while he was visiting this past week uh, that the church they attend, they have the uh, every Sunday night once a month or twice a month they get together with a group of congregations in that town there's a good number of churches where they are and with that they'll have a singing and five different congregations will gather at one place and have a group singing well I, th the point was that this helps them as a community of believers beyond the local congregation to get to know one another even better. Uh, we should know each other very well, obviously, and maybe we don't work hard enough at that sometimes. Uh, go ahead. Well, when I was in Minnesota, one of the things that I had to, uh, again, we, my husband preached in a congregation of less than 20, and one of the things that so oftentimes happened, if we had a meeting, People would come from other congregations, help us go through the neighborhoods, help us. Sometimes they would help us set up an outdoor meeting. I mean, they worked that particular week with us, and we did the same with them. We knew intimately those brethren, and that's a big thing because they're not right next door. You know, you're 45 minutes or But what I'm saying is, is that when I moved to Michigan, they thought I was talking about church cooperation. They were all isolated from one another. And I wasn't talking about church cooperation. I was talking about churches supporting one another. And we needed that help. <coughs> and when my husband was in the hospital dying, they went and they, it was a, a brotherhood. That's all I can say. Sure. And I haven't seen that 
I didn't see it in Michigan, and I don't see it many places. And we actually had people from Wisconsin, which is over an hour and 15 minutes, that came and did the same thing. There, there was a care for one another because of everyone needed help. Maybe we were all small except for one or two con congregations in the area. Good thoughts. Anything else? Okay, as we prepare to close, this is at least the last set of questions. Question 5a, what is meant in verse 29 to honor such men? Different, depending on the version, it might say hold such men in high esteem or in, in esteem or in high regard. Uh, in a simple sense, what does that mean to hold somebody in high esteem? The work they're doing. Okay. To think well of them. But you, it, it's, more than, it's more than me thinking that uh, a person, I can esteem a person, but when I hold somebody in high esteem or high regard, I, I feel at least that there's an implication that we share that with others. That if we're not, if we're not telling somebody else this person's a very you know, esteemable person, then it doesn't, it's not, it's not a great benefit. Uh, so I, I wanted to have just a brief discussion of how that's done because if we look to the scriptures and see what, how the apostles talked with other disciples and disciples talked about messengers and uh, all the different people that we're talking about in these unsung heroes, uh, we find people described that makes me know they were held in high esteem. Uh, Again, I, I don't see us today doing that to the degree that they did it in the first century. That's not to say, you know, we're doing wrong, but I think maybe we could do more of it. I, we, we all know, most of us here probably know the name Connie Adams, and maybe not everybody, because he goes back. But I know, because I know his name, that in the past, to me, people have held him in high esteem or Weldon Warnock, or Mike Willis, and, and on and on the names can go. Uh, but I, I just, anybody have any further thoughts or digestion about what that whole concept of holding people in esteem is and how we can do it better? Go ahead. <laughs> you got it. I don't know. I, I know that when John was looking for support when we, for his preaching, because the congregation could not support him, um, he went out and sent out letters looking for that, and it was through other brethren who would say, because well, they get millions of letters, and so they would say, what about this person? And someone would say, oh yes, I know that person. I know he's working in a bad, an area that is difficult. I know he is a this, 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 and this. And so that would help, because we would get that support. Uh, and so it was, that's one of the things that happened. <coughs> Yeah, uh, Paul himself needed somebody to vouch for him, you know, so right. uh, it, it never hurts to have somebody that we all know vouch for somebody else, you know, it kind of vets him. If somebody, we're going to have a gospel preacher come in here and hold a meeting, uh, we certainly want to know something about him before he comes. Well, Dave says, I met that guy for five years, that's great, you know. So Dave is esteeming that person right. to, yeah, so to that, help that further the... It's your reputation. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. That helps kill. Good. Good point. Kevin? Um, <clears throat> for Paul to, Paul to recommend Epaphrodite means he could really depend on it. Uh, you recall early on, way back then, things were healed between him and Mark that something happened and Paul just kind of like, I can't depend on him. But, you know, okay. you know they resolved that later on. But he could, when you help a, somebody like this, he does, he's restricted in his, you know, you gotta know he's gonna get it done. Uh, if you would, if you would help a preacher, I mean, we've resolved a lot of these issues. Back when Jason Hart was here, Jason was very innovative, and he got, a, he was doing a lot of things. And at one point, it, it became apparent. We asked him, "How much time do you spend a week just doing all the mundane things, posting?" He did so much uh, work on the website and things. He was spending over 15 or 16 hours a week doing repetitious, everyday, every week things. 
if you were to help a preacher do some of those things, uh, the preacher's going to have to know you're going to get it done. Or Good point. Get it. Get yeah. it. You will no help at all. And I think the paradise is like that. Great. And one more? Show a leader that you hold in high regard and respect is to emulate what they're doing. So if you if they're a good leader and you start to pick up their qualities and characteristics and emulate what they're doing and put the energy and effort into the, what they're doing of what you're doing, that shows the utmost respect in that group. Excellent. We're out of time. Thanks for your help.